when we introduced Benjamin Hoff's The Tao of Pooh last episode, we discussed the dangers of extrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation is when you get the satisfaction from the reward rather than the process that you go through to get the reward, which would be intrinsic motivation. You're motivated by your own inner nature and the process of trying to achieve a goal. We talked about how history education and really social studies education in general seems to be on the decline because of a shift in emphasis towards things having to have a clear-cut objective and career-based goals and other education buzzwords that you're going to hear thrown around. The Tao of Pooh, on the other hand, gives an outline for a way of life that's based on putting the importance on the journey instead of the destination. And it's really a book that outlines a ancient historical philosophy and brings it into the modern world. I'll talk about a lot of the principles in the book, but at its core, the book is just about giving a brief overview of Taoism, and on a more personal level, it's about making the most out of what you have, learning to appreciate simplicity and gaining an understanding of your place in the world around you. The first principle that Benjamin Hoff describes in his book is the Taoist principle of the uncarved block. The basic idea behind the uncarved block is that things in their original simplicity contain their own natural power. So this power is lost when simplicity is exchanged for complexity. The uncarved block roughly translates to the wood not cut. The idea is that when you have a block, it could be anything. You could turn it into whatever you want, but once it's carved, it is what it is. There's no more possibility. If you've never read any Winnie the Pooh or remember reading it when you were a kid or watching it as you were a kid, the basic idea is that Pooh is kind of this simple-minded bear who more or less stumbles and bumbles his way through all of these trials and tribulations. But at the end of the day, or at the end of the book, or at the end of the episode, things always seem to work out for Pooh. Here's Benjamin Hoff talking about this, quote, No matter how he may seem to others, especially to those fooled by appearances, Pooh, the uncarved block, is able to accomplish what he does because he is simple-minded. As any old Taoist walking out of the woods can tell you, simple-minded does not necessarily mean stupid. It's rather significant that the Taoist ideal is that of the still, calm, reflecting mirror mind of the uncarved block. And it's rather significant that Pooh, rather than the thinkers, Rabbit, Owl, or Eeyore, is the true hero of Winnie the Pooh. End quote. Hoff seems to get this idea from the famous Taoist text, supposedly penned by Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching. Here it is in chapter 67 discussing this idea of simplicity. Quote, I have just three things to teach. Simplicity, patience, compassion. These three are your greatest treasures. So the uncarved block and the principle of the uncarved block represents simplicity and looking at things as they are and seeing things for their natural way of being. But it also relates to the concept of humility. Here's Lao Tzu, again from the Tao Te Ching, quote, All streams flow to the sea because it is lower than they are. Humility gives it its power. If you want to govern the people, you must place yourself below them. You want to lead the people. You must learn how to follow them, end quote. I'm getting these quotes from the Tao Te Ching from 
Stephen Mitchell's translation, by the way, uh, this book is one of those things where there's a lot of different translations, and over the years, different words or phrases could be altered, and it could totally change the meaning. So it some people think it matters what version you read, and so on and so forth. So just fair warning, that's where I'm getting it. So anyway, this concept of humility is important because it brings us to the question of why do we seek knowledge, or why are we trying to get information, or why are we trying to learn things? Our motives and our intentions matter, and they cloud our inner nature. So the ideal is kind of the still and calm and reflecting mind, not necessarily the mind that is out desperately trying to seek whatever it is you're looking for. Benjamin Hoff alludes to this idea when he talks about, quote, the Eeyore attitude. He calls this knowledge for the sake of complaining about something. So if you don't know from the stories of Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore is kind of this donkey character who is always complaining about something. He's always depressed and he's always in a bad mood. He's actually smart and knows a lot about the world, but because of this negative attitude he has, it prevents any real accomplishments and it gets in the way of real knowledge and wisdom and happiness. Benjamin Hoff quotes this story of Eeyore looking at himself in the stream, you know, in the mirror, and calling himself pathetic. And it relates to this idea of how often do we criticize ourselves or mock others or look for the worst in someone or some situation or be self-deprecating without realizing that there is this yin and yang in life and maybe by looking at the worst in the situation in a different way, we can pull some useful wisdom out of it. Of course, this is easier said than done. As Lao Tzu said, the way is very easy to understand and very easy to practice, but nobody understands it and nobody practices it. Here's Benjamin Hoff summing up that uncarved block principle, the first chapter of his book, essentially. Quote, When you discard arrogance, complexity, and a few other things that get in the way, sooner or later you will discover that simple, childlike, and mysterious secret known to those of the uncarved block, that life is fun. From the state of the uncarved block comes the ability to enjoy the simple and the quiet, the natural and the plain. Along with that comes the ability to do things spontaneously and have them work, odd as that may appear to others at time. As Piglet put it in Winnie the Pooh, quote, Pooh hasn't much brain, but he never comes to any harm. He does silly things, and they turn out right, end quote. After the uncarved block, the second principle that Benjamin Hoff discusses in the book is this idea of traditional education and why people seek knowledge. So Hoff and other Taoists generally scoff at scholars, academics, and intellectuals who, in their view, seek to bloviate and complicate things unnecessarily. The example in Pooh would be the character of Owl, who seems to have knowledge just for the sake of knowledge. One Taoist writer said that the scholar is restricted by his own learning. And as Lao Tzu said, wise men don't need to prove their point. Men who need to prove their point aren't wise. Here's Benjamin Hoff slamming the culture of academia and education. Quote, it seems rather odd somehow that Taoism, the way of the whole man, the true man, the spirit man, to use a few Taoist terms, is for the most part interpreted here in the West by the scholarly owl, by the brain, the academic, the dry as dust, absent-minded professor. Far from reflecting the Taoist ideal of wholeness and independence, this incomplete and unbalanced creature divides all kinds of abstract things into little categories and compartments, while remaining rather helpless and disorganized in his daily life. Rather than learn from Taoist teachers and from direct experience, he learns intellectually and indirectly from books, 
and since he doesn't usually put Taoist principles into practice in an everyday sort of way, his explanations of them tend to leave out some rather important detail, such as how they work and where you can apply them. On top of that, it is very hard to find any of the spirit of Taoism in the lifeless writings of the humorless academic mortician, whose bleached-out scholarly dissertations contain no more of the character of Taoist wisdom than does the typical wax museum. End quote. Wow, I mean, that's a pretty thorough beatdown of your boring professor, and you get the sense that this guy probably had a few of those in his career and probably worked with a few of those that he didn't particularly like. But anyway, you get his point. It's not enough just to learn the knowledge and the theory. You have to put it into practice and use it to work for the gain of others. Using big and fancy words and having the appearance of superiority and acting like you know everything all the time. We all know these kinds of people. This is not something that the Taoist way, at least according to Hoff, would approve of. Knowledge and experience need to work together. Not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge. There's more to knowing than just being correct. There's a great story from Pooh that Hoff describes here where Owl and Piglet are spending paragraphs and paragraphs debating how to spell Tuesday. And there's a lot of confusion over what day it is and how to spell it and what day is the best. And they're arguing about, you know, what day of the week is the best. And they ask Pooh about it and they say, hey, what's your favorite day? And he says, today is my favorite day. For someone like me who's been in his fair share of pointless academic debates, that story rang true. The third principle that Benjamin Hoff describes in the Tao of Pooh is the concept of inner nature. The idea is that everybody and everything has their own personal inner nature. And violating that inner nature and going against what you are is generally seen as a bad thing in Taoism. This is one of the concepts where Taoism often gets muddled and confused from people who are trying to interpret it. I think that the idea is that you need to understand your inner nature, and then that way you can tweak it and improve upon it. But if you just completely ignore your inner nature, then ultimately that's going to lead to bad things because you're going to try to be something that you're not. So there's a very subtle distinction there, but we'll try and get into it here. The idea for Hoff in the book is that everything has a place and a function. It's kind of like the idea of yin and yang. There wouldn't be good without bad. There wouldn't be bad without good. Without light, there would be no darkness. Without dark, there would be no light. So knowing your place and your function in your personal life, your relationships, your job, and your family is key. There's a Chinese proverb that says, one disease, long life. No disease, short life. The idea is that if you have a weakness, then you can recognize it. And then take the necessary steps to improve upon that weakness. If you think you have no weakness or no diseases, then you're sure to fail when that weakness inevitably gets exposed. So knowing your limitations, knowing your inner nature, is going to be good for you. And unfortunately, this is tough to do sometimes because you have to kind of look inside and have a reckoning with what your biggest weaknesses are and all the areas that you've failed in the past. But if you can get over that, then weaknesses can turn into strengths the second you pause and acknowledge them as weaknesses. Benjamin Hoff describes the situation that we all know where someone just refuses to accept what's right in front of their face and continues making the same mistakes. He uses the example of Tigger in the Winnie the Pooh stories. Tigger is kind of this character who is impulsive and always kind of getting himself into trouble. 
in the story, Hoff tells Tigger is kind of trying to convince everyone that he's the best at everything he does, including tree climbing, and he climbs the trees so well and so effectively that he gets to the top without realizing he has no way to get back down. I think that George R. R. Martin summarizes this concept of inner nature and its relationship to Taoism very well in his book, A Game of Thrones. He says, quote, Never forget what you are, for surely the world will not. Make it your strength, then it can never be your weakness. Armor yourself in it, and it will never be used to hurt you. End quote. Who would have thought there'd be some Taoism in Game of Thrones? But anyway, the basic idea is that you need to accept when you don't know something. I mean, in my personal experience, I think I don't know are probably the three least used consecutive words in the English language. Sometimes it's okay to say I don't know. Accept things as they are and try to figure out how you can know and how you can improve from there instead of refusing to see your inner nature and lying to yourself and the people around you. As Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching, quote, Be content with what you have. Rejoice in the way things are. When you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. End quote. Being content with what you have and being content with your inner nature is not just some hipster way of thinking about the world, it actually gives you more control over your own life. Here's Benjamin Hoff talking about that, quote, Rather than be carried along by circumstances and manipulated by those who can see the weaknesses and behavior tendencies that we ignore, we can work with our own characteristics and be in control of our own lives. The way to self-reliance starts with recognizing who we are, what we've got to work with, and what works best for us, end quote. And if you don't like that inner nature, if you think that's something you don't want to embrace, then redirect it or channel it in a way that helps you, rather than just completely eliminating it. You never know when it might be useful. As Lao Tzu said, the bad can be raw material for the good. Again, I don't think he's saying there that when bad things happen, that's okay, but he is saying if something bad does happen to you, then figure out a way to channel that and turn it into something that can be good and helpful for yourself and others, rather than just pouting about it. The next principle that Benjamin Hoff goes through in the Tao of Pooh is something called Wu Wei. It roughly translates to without doing, causing, or making. Action through inaction. Doing without doing. And the idea is that now that we've established what an inner nature is, the idea is you don't want to go against the nature of things. You want to be kind of like a river flowing. Instead of going through the rock, the water flowing through the river is going to go around the rock. Famous Taoist saying goes something like, Tao does not do, but nothing is not done. The idea is to be effortless. As Stephen Mitchell points out in his translation of the Tao Te Ching in his introduction, he says that this concept of doing without doing is often mistaken for being passive and letting people walk over you and maybe even not caring about what's going on with you and with the world. Because if you really cared, you'd go out and you'd want to, you know, make a difference and get something done. But Stephen Mitchell says that this isn't true. It's obvious that Lao Tzu cared about people and about the way to govern people. Otherwise, he wouldn't have written this book where he outlines in quite a number of different ways what he sees as the best way to live and the best way to govern people for the well-being of everybody. To him, the concept of Wu Wei is very similar to being in the zone in sports. So if anyone has played a sport, take for example basketball, where you'll hear about these incredible athletes who 
go through these phases in the game where they're just on fire and they're not thinking about what they're doing. They're just reacting to things. And it's difficult to describe without being in that state yourself. But there does seem to be this state you can enter where you get in the zone and things are working out for you, but you're also not pressing and forcing the issue too much. Here's Benjamin Hoff talking about being in the zone. Quote, when you work with Wu Wei, you put the round peg in the round hole and the square peg in the square hole. No stress, no struggle. Egotistical desire tries to force the round peg into the square hole and the square peg into the round hole. Cleverness tries to devise craftier ways of making pegs fit where they don't belong. Knowledge tries to figure out why round pegs fit round holes, but not square holes. Wu Wei doesn't try. It doesn't think about it. It just does it. And when it does, it doesn't appear to do much of anything. But things get done. End quote. So this approach of action through inaction is a way of living, but it's also an approach to problem solving that many people have found effective and that it appears Lao Tzu was advocating for. And this comes to personal lives, but it also relates to governments. And it appears Lao Tzu was advocating that rarely is meeting force with force or violence with violence, a good answer. Instead, try to deflect that negative energy away, defend yourself, or neutralize it. The analogy would kind of be like the martial art Tai Chi. I've heard some people call this the non-violence principle, but let's take a look at what Lao Tzu himself had to say about it. Quote, Weapons are the tools of violence. All decent men detest them. Weapons are the tools of fear. A decent man will avoid them, except in the direst necessity, and if compelled, will use them only with the utmost restraint. Peace is his highest value. If the peace has been shattered, how can he be content? His enemies are not demons, but human beings like himself. He doesn't wish them personal harm, nor does he rejoice in victory. How could he rejoice in victory and delight in the slaughter of men? He enters a battle gravely, with sorrow, and with great compassion, as if he were attending a funeral. End quote. Reading through the Tao Te Ching, it was incredibly interesting to me how this guy from thousands of years ago, if he did exist, or maybe it was just a combination of many different writers, but regardless, how they were able to provide advice that seemingly would apply to a lot of the situations that we find ourselves in today, whether it be personal or whether it be on the level of government. And you wonder, in this case, if more people didn't take this advice, if the world wouldn't be a much better place. The next idea that Benjamin Hoff describes in the Tao of Pooh is what he calls a busy baxon. And this is a person who is desperately active, goal-oriented, and superficial. So there's a classic Taoist proverb of some guy who dislikes the fact that he leaves footprints, and he doesn't like seeing the footprints, and he also doesn't like seeing his shadow. And of course, it's going to be fruitless to try and achieve any of these goals because he doesn't understand that having a shadow is just going to be a natural part of being in the world. So wasting time with goals like that is not going to be helpful for anybody. I think we all know people like this where you ask someone what their interests are and it's all superficial and they start describing the physical activities that they take part in. They're always going somewhere, looking for some sort of goal or reward. There's always some place better to be. Someone might be playing on their phone, texting other people when they're in the company of others instead of just enjoying their time. I know I'm guilty of that myself. There's always something or some place just down the road 
where the grass is always going to be greener. With this external and extrinsic motivation, for these people, the idea of progress is not changing or bettering yourself, it's conquering others. And if only certain historical figures took that advice. These people are always trying to save time and avoid wasting time, not realizing that you can only spend time, wisely or foolishly. As Brandon Sanderson says, journey before destination. Taoist teaching teaches to get the reward from the process, not the goal. Here's Lao Tzu on that in chapter 9 of the Tao Te Ching. Quote, Fill your bowl to the brim, and it will spill. Keep sharpening your knife, and it will blunt. Chase after money and security, and your heart will never unclench. Care about people's approval, and you will be their prisoner. End quote. So instead of constantly looking to others or looking down the road for something better or looking for other people for validation, you can instead choose to recognize your own value and your own utility. Benjamin Hoff tells an amazing story towards the end of the book about this very concept of how it's difficult for people to recognize their own value and the fact that everyone has their own inner nature and inherently their own value. And he calls this the Chinese story of the stonecutter. This is kind of a long one, but it's also a good one and I think important in its simplicity. Quote, There was once a stonecutter who was dissatisfied with himself and with his position in life. One day he passed a wealthy merchant's house and through the open gateway saw many fine possessions and important visitors. How powerful that merchant must be, thought the stonecutter. He became very envious and wished that he could be like the merchant. Then he would no longer have to live the life of a mere stonecutter. To his great surprise, he suddenly became the merchant, enjoying more luxuries and power than he had ever dreamed of envied and detested by those less wealthy than himself. But soon a high official passed by, carried in a sedan chair, accompanied by attendants and escorted by soldiers, beating gongs. Everyone, no matter how wealthy, had to bow low before the procession. How powerful that official is, he thought. I wish that I could be a high official. Then he became the high official, carried everywhere in his embroidered sedan chair, feared and hated by the people all around who had to bow down before him as he passed. It was a hot summer day, and the official felt very uncomfortable in the sticky sedan chair. He looked up at the sun. It shone proudly in the sky, unaffected by his presence. How powerful the sun is, he thought. I wish that I could be the sun. Then he became the sun, shining fiercely down on everyone, scorching the fields, cursed by the farmers and laborers, but a huge black cloud moved between him and the earth so that his light could no longer shine on everything below. How powerful that storm cloud is, he thought. I wish that I could be a cloud. Then he became the cloud, flooding the fields and villages, shouted at by everyone, but soon he found that he was being pushed away by some great force and realized that it was the wind. How powerful it is, he thought. I wish that I could be the wind. Then he became the wind, blowing tiles off the roofs of houses, uprooting trees, hated and feared by all below him. But after a while, he ran up against something that would not move, no matter how forcefully he blew against it. A huge, towering stone. How powerful that stone is, he thought. I wish that I could be a stone. Then he became the stone, more powerful than anything else on earth. But as he stood there, he heard the sound of a hammer pounding a chisel into the solid rock, and felt himself being changed. What could be more powerful than I, the stone, he thought. He looked down and saw far below him the figure of a stone cutter. End quote. Again, kind of a long story there, but it does give you some perspective on the rat race that many of ourselves are caught up in and the importance of recognizing the value of the individual. 
one of the last concepts that Hoff talks about in his book is the idea of nothing. Here's what he says towards the end about that, quote, The key that unlocks the doors of wisdom, happiness, and truth. What is that magic, mysterious something? Nothing. To the Taoist, nothing is something. And something, at least the sort of thing that many consider to be important, is really nothing at all. End quote. Hoff points out that we all do have this natural instinct to want to intervene and get involved and do things, but Oftentimes, this leads to just complicating the situation. Hoff quotes someone who says that music is the space between the notes. And the Taoist proverb, quote, to gain knowledge, add things every day. To gain wisdom, remove things every day. I do believe that a lot of people look at Taoism and they see this as a lack of compassion or caring, or they see this lack of doing as weakness. But I think that Lao Tzu would say that this concept and these concepts we've talked about are all just strategies for compassion, caring, and heart. I do think that people who think this about Taoism, this idea that there's a lack of compassion there, are mistaken. As Benjamin Hoff says in his book, you can't have wisdom without compassion. There's often a question as to what is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And Benjamin Hoff has the best summary of that difference that I've ever heard. He says, quote, knowledge doesn't really care, wisdom does, end quote. And to tie it back to the first episode we did on the Tao of Pooh about studying history and how that relates to philosophy and why studying history might be important, you have to have compassion, you have to care in order for the study of history really to be relevant. It's not a coincidence that the very last chapter of the Tao Te Ching is about compassion, helping other people, and giving to others. Quote, The master has no possessions. The more he does for others, the happier he is. The more he gives to others, the wealthier he is. Okay, so that's going to do it for our bit on the Tao of Pooh. I am aware that this episode and the one before probably felt a little bit more like an episode of Philosophize This than maybe a history podcast, but I do think that's okay to delve into topics like this from time to time. And I do think it's important to understand some of the histories behind the ancient philosophies and I think in particular Taoism has more practical applications than you would think, and I think it pops up a lot in pop culture for a lot of reasons because it's very interesting. I mean, Star Wars, of course, we talked about Game of Thrones a little bit, The Way of Kings from Brandon Sanderson. Uh, There's definitely a lot of ideas from Taoism that percolate around things that are interesting in the modern day. Anyway, um, just to be clear, I don't necessarily agree with all of the principles and philosophies in the book, but even if you don't, I I think that there's something to be learned from the Tao of Pooh. I think it's a very interesting book with a lot of interesting things that are going to be practical to a lot of people, so I definitely think it's worth picking up and giving a read. It's a very short book, so I think there's a lot of stuff in there that could be useful for a lot of people, even if you don't necessarily agree with all of it. After all, sometimes reading something or being presented with something you disagree with and then having the opportunity to ask those questions about why you disagree with it is going to help you build a better understanding of 
what you do believe and, and why. So I think it is important to kind of analyze all sorts of different old school historical philosophies and religions and things like that. So I'll consider doing some more episodes like this in the future. But in the near future, it's going to get back to old school reflecting history with more concrete historical analysis. As always, thanks for listening. I really appreciate all the positive feedback I've been getting, and it really is cool to know that there are people out there enjoying it and getting something from it. So just want to say thanks for listening, and until next time, that's it for me.